Um, <clears throat> there is today a fierce debate over big business raging in our political culture. Underlying frequent denunciations of woke capitalism, for example, or protests against the greed of large corporations is a deeper argument about the proper role of our most powerful economic institution. But what is the purpose of the corporation and how can purpose be integrated into our economic lives? Welcome to today's Hedgehog Noon discussion sponsored by the Hedgehog Review and its publisher, the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at UVA. I am Jay Tolson, editor of the Hedgehog Review, and we are fortunate to be joined today by two speakers who have produced distinguished work on, among other things, American political economy. Both will be speaking about and beyond their respective essays in the current issue of THR, which bears the thematic title, Markets and the Good. <clears throat> Michael Lynn's career, rich and varied as, as it is, almost fails to capture the polymathic range of this renegade Texas intellectual and author. A graduate of the University of Texas and Yale Universities, Lind has taught at Harvard University, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Texas, and he has been an editor or staff writer for the New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, The National Interest. He is a contributing writer now to The Tablet and has written often for the New York Times and the Financial Times. He has also worked at the State Department and was a co-founder of the New America Foundation, now just New America. He is uh, the most recent of his some 17 books, which include works of fiction and poetry, is Hell to Pay, How the Suppression of Wages is Destroying America and his contribution to our current issue, Profit, Power, and Purpose, Rethinking the Modern Corporation, is the piece he will speak from. Our other speaker is my colleague, Kyle Williams, senior editor of the Hedgehog Review and a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. An intellectual historian, Kyle did his graduate work at Rutgers University, and before that received a degree in classics from the honors program at the University of Oklahoma. A contributor to numerous publications, including The Baffler, he's the author of the forthcoming book on the history of American business titled Taming the Octopus, The Long Battle for the Soul of the Corporation. His essay in the current issue is titled the myth of the Friedman Doctrine. Just a word about the format. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and then they will engage in a, an exchange with each other for another 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Michael, thank you for being here, and please hit off. Well, thank you, Jay, and, and it's an honor to be uh, uh, writing for the Hedgehog Review and, and to be addressing such a distinguished group today. Uh, so the question of the purpose of the corporation was uh, not a big question until really the latter part of the 19th century, because before that time, chartered corporations in, in Europe and in Britain and the American colonies, later the United States and Canada uh, and other uh, Anglophone lands of settlement had a single purpose. You know, uh, they were chartered to run a municipal waterworks or to run a toll road. Uh, and they could be for-profit or non-profit, and they could run an orphanage. But there was no mystery about what their uh, uh, purpose was. Uh, and as uh, the legally trained among you know, there was the uh, ultra virus doctrine, uh, which said that uh, the corporation could only perform these activities uh, for which it was chartered. So if you, you know, chartered uh, uh, a toll bridge, uh, that company could not then set up a waterworks uh, or a dog racing track or, you know, whatever it wanted to do. So you had uh, regulation by charter uh, in this period. And so the original corporations were more like in modern terms, they were more like government contractors uh, or, or like uh, public utilities. Uh, so they're, they're best viewed as a kind of spun off 
uh, semi-privatized state agencies. Uh, and, uh, you know, Kyle knows the history, of, uh, I'm sure, better than I do. So I won't, I'll just skim over that very quickly. But then you get two doctrines that uh, transform the American corporation. One, one is general incorporation. Instead of having to go to the state legislature to charter your particular company, uh, you just submit a form to the Secretary of State. Uh, and presto, you know, you have a a for-profit company or a non-profit uh, organization. Uh, there's no paperwork. And and the reason this was adopted was the, the perception in the Jacksonian era and similarly in, in Victorian Britain uh, that, uh, that projectors, as uh, investors were called and entrepreneurs, were bribing legislators for corporate charters. So, so this way you get around the... The corruption problem creates other corruption problems later, but but you, you don't have to bribe anybody in the state legislature if you want to found your own corporation today. Uh, so that's general incorporation, uh, and and then you get limited liability, which is really a radical thing. Uh, it because limited liability earlier than that was uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, that is, you you could not uh, sue the king's government or the, the 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 republic's government for certain activities. Uh, and in particular, in, in, in the corporate uh, context, it means that if you uh, if a corporation goes bankrupt and owes debts to creditors, the creditors cannot go after the individual assets of the investors. It's different from a partnership in that sense. Uh, so both of these uh, uh, well, I won't say both of them. I won't say limited liability was necessary to have uh, industrial development. That is, nobody's going to invest in in risky, gigantic railroads and you know automobile companies and and electric battery companies and so on on a massive scale with the pools of capital you need. Uh, if the creditors, once it goes bankrupt. As most startups do, the vast majority of startups fail within a couple of years. Uh, if they can then uh, go after all of the personal property and savings uh, of the uh, of the investors, so so arguably limited liability was good. Uh, the problem arises with uh, general corporation and uh, with the end of regulation by charter. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that today, as I point out in my article for the Hedgehog Review, I can, uh, with some friends, can create the anything corporation. And the purpose is whatever we want it to do, right? And uh, it's it's a perpetual, uh, potentially perpetual entity with these uh, this very powerful legal privilege of limited liability. Uh, and uh, the government really has no say uh, in our activities through the charter itself. So uh, there have been, uh, uh, and I won't get into the details and, and I'll defer to, to Kyle on this, but basically once you lose regulation from the inside, that is regulation by charter that specifies the only things that a, a corporation with limited liability can do, uh, then you have to have regulation from the outside. But of course the problem with regulation from the outside is the corporate world is this incredible menagerie. I mean, it's everything from, you know, a three-person lawn mowing business, you know, to a globe-straddling automobile company. And, and any kind of regulation that applies to all of these different entities uh, simultaneously and fairly is likely to be too abstract uh, uh, in, in many cases. Uh, so, so you know, you do need enterprises on a massive scale uh, in an industrial society. And in spite of what people say, we still live in an industrial society. The, the employment sector is post-industrial. Uh, most people work in the services sector, but that's been true. It's, it's always been true in the industrial era. Uh, uh, at no point were manufacturing workers more than about a third of the population. Uh, the main difference is that farmers became uh, manufacturing and service workers, but we've always had a service worker majority, but an industrial economy. And uh, in spite of claims 
by my friends in the Neo Brandeisian small is beautiful antitrust movement, uh, you really can't have mom and pop aerospace enterprises and backyard automobile companies and and uh, iPhone manufacturers and things like that. So you so you're going to have enormous scale. It could be state socialist, uh, and that's been tried uh, with generally. With, with, with some success in, in some cases, but generally if there's no uh, incentive for the managers uh, to do better, if they're salaried public servants, then, you know, it, it tends to stagnate. Uh, so uh, one, one alternative uh, that's being discussed is a benefit corporation, uh, which is a kind of regulation by charter, I guess, that is, it'd be a special kind of corporation that, uh, uh, promises, you know, social benefits and wider stakeholders rather than, you know, simply trying to maximize the short-term uh, uh, payout to to the investors and shareholders. Uh, the problem with that is it's still kind of abstract, right? Because it says nothing about the particular purpose of that corporation. It's, just, it's kind of a procedural thing. Uh, so uh, I do think there's a problem with creating... Per uh, potentially immortal uh, government privileged entities that are uh, over which the government has no direct supervision or control as long as they follow basic legal procedures that they share with the vast majority of tiny, uh, weak, uninfluential uh, corporations, then they can do whatever they want to. Uh, I have a piece coming out in Tablet uh, on big foundations. I make a similar criticism. Uh, and often this is recycled corporate money. Uh, if you think of the Gates Foundation and, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and so on, uh, these are like enormous pools of money that can exist generation after generation, century after century. And as long as they follow the procedures, they too have complete discretion in, in terms of what they do, that they're answerable only to themselves. Uh, so uh, in, in, I think we're now moving into a post-globalist, post-liberal world economy as a result basically of the rise of China and the reaction of the US and, and others, which is taking a mercantilist uh, you know, kind of strategic trade form. Uh, and, uh, and particularly manufacturing now, the location of manufacturing, uh, neoclassical economists say that the location of manufacturing around the world is, is dependent on the comparative advantage of companies, which is which is nonsense. Uh, uh, the only countries that are industrialized are ones that had decades or generations of, of strategic trade, industrial policy, you know, state capitalist investment, and so on. It's it's always been rigged. So we're going back to that kind of uh, uh, quasi mercantilism and and rivalry for shares of global industry among companies among countries. So the question is, well, what shape do these uh, enterprises take? Uh, the East Asian model is basically to tolerate or encourage uh, monopolies or a few large oligopolistic firms, which are efficient. They can reap increasing returns to scale in manufacturing uh, and, and uh, 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 other things. Uh, typically, and this is true of Japan and South Korea and, and also of, uh, to the lesser extent of Taiwan as well as the People's Republic of China, you have a protected market. Uh, if you can't use tariffs, the Japanese, for example, use non-tariff barriers for generations to keep out American and European products. So from the base of this protected home market, your national champions are then in, and they're private champions. Uh, but they defer to the government, which tends to control them, not directly, but indirectly through uh, nudging uh, credit towards them uh, through the private banking system or sometimes through public systems. So, so from their protected home base, these national champions then go out into the world. And the successful ones, I drive a Toyota. I mean, that's an example. Uh, you know, uh, the, China has not yet had any of its uh, national champions, real, TikTok maybe, but in, in manufacturing, not yet uh, uh, go global, but it's probably only a matter of time. 
Uh, and so I think that is that is probably uh, a likely model which the U.S. and Europe will adopt uh, in self-defense against uh, East Asian mercantilism to some degree. And we we saw this in the 2008 uh, global crisis. You know, everybody's saying, "Oh, companies are now global; uh, they have no national identity," and so on. And then the you know uh, Ford and GM get bailed out by the U.S. government, and Opel you know gets bailed out by the German government. So if you look at uh, uh, the the data of the U of the United Nations data on uh, the sales of of uh, the top corporations in the world, uh, there's something called the transnationality index, uh, which measures how much is in the home market of the company and how much is in the rest of the world. Uh, the the TNI, the transnationality index, is about about forty uh, percent. In other words, what we call global corporations like Daimler Benz and and Ford and and Boeing and and so on uh, and Airbus uh, actually tend to have nearly half of their sales in their home market. And the three biggest home markets, which account for a disproportionate share of global companies, happen not coincidentally to be the three most populous uh, capitalist countries. If you discount China, that is the United States, Japan, and Germany in order of population. Uh, so, so it's kind of a myth that these corporations really are footloose and have cut ties with their home bases. And when you look at their boards of directors and their managers, it's overwhelmingly national. There are a few exceptions, uh, you know. But but you know, Daimler Benz is a German company. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Boeing and and GM, even if they have sales and affiliates in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, these are these are basically American companies. So we may go the national uh, uh, champion route. The other alternative, which we have used creatively in the United States in the past, if, if we want to have more control over the activities of these huge pools of uh, money uh, and, and uh, employees and, and, and plant, uh, is uh, federally charted single purpose corporations. You know, the post office is a corporation, uh, a nonprofit corporation, but it's a corporation chartered by the US government. So is the uh, uh, Export Import Bank, the Exim Bank. Uh, so, so, and the sec first and second banks of the United States, they were, they were chartered government corporations. Uh, so, so there are alternatives to simply letting uh, us, you know, me and my, my friends create the anything corporation you know, by uh, you know, submitting forms to to the Secretary of State in in Delaware or New Jersey or some you know kind of lax uh, jurisdiction, and then when it becomes a multi billion dollar globe straddling enterprise, uh, you know, then then the government really has very few tools for uh, channeling or or overseeing our activities. So that's my story, uh, officer, and I'm sticking to it. Um, Jay, you're muted. Let me unmute. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, just very quickly before we go to Kyle, what is the problem for which those alternatives are, are stated as solution, possible solutions? I mean, that's the one of the points you made in the piece. Could you very quickly say that? Yeah, the, the main problem as I see it, and I'm a defender of, of big business. I, I co-authored with Robert T. Atkinson a book in 2018 uh, from MIT Press called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. Uh, in inappropriate sectors, you want uh, big concentrated uh, firms. But the problem is that they will, they will have market power by virtue of the fact that one or a few firms dominates the market. And they can use this market power uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, drive small companies out of business uh, in order to gouge you know, uh, consumers you know, with, with artificially high prices. Uh, uh, in, you know, they have essentially, uh, unless they're unionized, there's no, no uh, autonomy on the part of the workers because the janitor of IBM or Apple does not really negotiate over 
terms of employment and and wages with uh, this giant corporation. That's ridiculous. Uh, so so the problem is, uh, on the one hand, you, we want to create massive enterprises, to uh, in particular sectors, not all sectors. In restaurants, there is no comparative advantage or, or, or uh, economies of scale between a good mom and pop restaurant uh, and a national chain. So if you know, antitrust is fine there. If, if the national chain is, 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 it's no benefit over the, the small restaurant. But, but in manufacturing and telecommunications and infrastructure, we need these, these giant enterprises and they're not going to be restrained by market competition, even if there are three or four of them. Uh, so uh, it's a particularly a problem in, in with conglomerates that are the result of conglomerate mergers. Uh, so it's one thing if an automobile company merges with autom other automobile companies, it becomes a bigger, more efficient automobile company. I, I would say, well, you know, that that's not a problem. Uh, but if the automobile company uh, then buys a movie theaters and begins making its own uh, movies and TV shows uh, and opens up theme parks and buys up restaurants across the country, that's a real, real threat uh, to business because they can use the deep pockets, the money they have in one business, to underwrite uh, their their the other businesses uh, until they drive their rivals out of business. So uh, I, I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic to uh, you know of, of vertical and horizontal mergers in the same industry, but once you get Jeff Bezos and Amazon you know, going into the movie making business, uh, you know, that I mean, it's a retail corporation, but but right now we can't say under this general incorporation regime that uh, this is ultra virus, that Amazon should not stick to retail and shouldn't make movies. Thank you, Michael. Um, Kyle, jump in. Yeah, well, um, thanks uh, Jay and uh, for moderating. Thanks, thanks Michael for uh, joining the conversation with us today and for writing um, this piece for us. Uh, I just want to talk for a few minutes about my um, the essay that I wrote for the latest issue of the Hedgehog, and, and then I'll close uh, by circling back around to some questions that I think um, you raised, Michael, about the relationship between big business institutions and, and society. Um, so I titled my essay, the, the Myth of the Friedman Doctrine, and I use the the word myth in in uh, in two ways. The, the first is the more kind of conventional way in which we understand that word. That there's a kind of erroneous or non non factual problematic understanding of the of the past. So part part of the essay is sort of an attempt to clear up some misunderstandings about Milton Friedman and this this really influential article that he wrote in 1970. Um, and the misunderstanding that I have in mind is a story that goes something like this. American business was more or less doing a, a good job of achieving the sort of prosperity that workers and consumers and the rest of society also benefited from. But then Friedman wrote his article in which he propounded this view that the sole social responsibility of management is to generate profits for shareholders. And then within a decade or two, the shareholder value movement was in full swing, transforming big business into an institution that benefited shareholders to the detriment of other stakeholders. So um, the the myth here, what's the myth here? I'm not really interested in, in disputing Friedman's view of corporations. I, I'm kind of approaching this from a more of a historian's perspective. And in the histories that, that many scholars and journalists tell about the development of business over the last 50 years or so, it's Milton Friedman's article that's really taken on an outsized role. Um, it's often sort of thought of as a kind of a smoking gun or a blueprint, uh, a game plan for a Wall Street takeover of corporate America. And then of all the other assorted deals that um, many of us are familiar with at this point of financialization and corporate elite so focused on shareholder value, share price, quarterly earnings, return on investments of short termism, if you will, that it's undermined um, this post-war way of life, uh, prosperity, the industrial underpinnings of the middle class and so forth. 
So one thing that I argue in the, in, um, the piece is that the ideal of shareholder value that Milton Friedman propounded um, didn't, and this may seem obvious, but um, but it did not transform the economy the moment it was written down. I mean, for one thing, Fr Friedman was writing about these ideas for quite a long time, and he had articulated something along the lines of the Friedman Doctrine in many different places over the last 20 years leading up to that. For another thing, these strategies of financialization and and debt leveraging and an activist Wall Street and so forth um, were not really disseminated by Milton Friedman. Um, you'd be better off looking at the history of corporate consulting if you want to know that story. And, and there are people who've written about this. Lewis Hyman's book, uh, Temp, is really good on this. Um, now, um, um, of course, the, this history, the history of the transformation of the corporation over the last 40 or 50 years is not all about uh, ideas. Um, you also have to observe the ways in which you know, finance capital and the rise of leverage buyouts and other kinds of circumstances just transformed not just the American economy, but the global one in the in the 80s and 90s. So my, my point in short was that Milton Friedman did not open some kind of Pandora's box. Um, I argue that th this basic idea of shareholder supervision of corporate institutions was um, not a radical innovation of the late 20th century. It, it really goes to the heart of the system of corporate capitalism that Americans have known since the era of the New Deal at the very latest. Um, you know, uh, it, it was during this time that you see the construction of the Securities and Exchange Commission and the reform of the New York Stock Exchange in the years after the Wall Street crash of 1929. It's, it's, um, it sort of confounds a lot of our narratives about uh, American political history, but it's nevertheless true that this liberal project of business reform overseen by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the early 1930s was the very one that put shareholders in this unique position that they still enjoy, at least at the federal level, as a, as a privileged class with special rights and responsibilities to oversee the conduct of directors and managers and of course, to benefit financially from the success of large publicly traded corporations. Um, now, there's a lot more that I could say about all of this, uh, but perhaps it's enough just to say that um, it's in the 1970s, Milton Friedman was articulating something on the lines of a conventional wisdom of 20th century liberalism, though, of course, with a kind of neoliberal spin. And the neoliberal spin was that he held really high hopes for the ability of financial markets to make corporations efficient and accountable. And, and of course, this is the big distinction between the kind of liberalism that we associate with the with FDR and the New Deal and the early 20th century or the mid 20th century and the later neoliberalism of the 20th century is how they thought about markets. For FDR liberals, markets had a tendency to fail and they knew that because they had seen it. Um, they could be dangerous and they could be um, unstable and they weren't always good at allocate, allocating resources efficiently. And so they needed government help to function well. For neoliberals, the markets um, simply needed to be freed from regulation and from prejudice in order to just simply be markets. So there's really a really high expectation and a high hope about what markets are capable of doing. Um, so in short, I guess what I'm doing in my piece is doing what historians like to do, which is complicate things. Um, now, I said that there was two ways that I thought about the myth of the Friedman Doctrine. One is that kind of erroneous view of its influence. But but the other way that we think about myth, of course, is that it's not about it being unfactual, but rather that myth is, um, it, it's just a, it's a guiding force. This, this is a kind of sociological way of thinking about myth um, that in, in, at least as far as the Milton Friedman doctrine goes, it, it became something of an ethical imaginary, a kind of conventional wisdom in the realm of respectable opinion. It became in the last 40 years, the sort of obvious way in which big business should be organized. Uh, and this idea has had you know, tremendous consequences. And, and the reason that it is so difficult for us to imagine a world without it uh, and that it is so difficult to unseat this idea is because our large publicly traded corporate institutions have been structured for so long in such a way that privileges shareholders. Um, 
I guess you could you could say that the American system of corporate capitalism always had a kind of hidden vulnerability to something like the Friedman Doctrine. Um, so why does all of this matter? Uh, it, it matters because if we want to fix this vulnerability, if we want to um, uh, think creatively about how economic institutions can be organized in the way that, that Michael is has done with us today already, and um, I'm sure we'll have more of a chance to talk about it. Um, we can't just hope that Fortune 500 CEOs will start having a better perspective on things. Um, we have to think about what we might call corporate control or corporate governance. You know, who, who gets power and how and for what purposes. Um, we have to think about how corporate control actually works, the, the way that it motivates business leaders to do certain things and not other things, what it uh, does to hold them accountable to certain defined interests. Um, and so I wanna close by saying that, you know, there are, I think, resources in the American political culture and in, in progressive and Republican traditions for rethinking corporate control. Um, I, I write about this in the, the book that I have coming out uh, next year, that there are, there are basically three ways that Americans have ten, tended to think about how corporate control should be made accountable to democratic interests. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna run through these three ways that's gonna taxonomy real quick, because I think these three ways into the problem of governance can, can help, um, can be helpful for having a conversation about the relationship between our economic institutions and society. Um, and indeed for thinking about what, you know, uh, what normative ideas about what the good is can have, uh, uh, what influence it can have on our economic institutions. So um, the first way that um, Americans have tended to think about, about corporate control is the most familiar, of course, it's the ideal of market competition. Um, that is that competition will keep economic actors and institutions accountable. Though, um, you know, over the, over the last few decades, the corporate system has been skewed toward a very narrow version of market supervision, a very financialized one. Um, now, so the, the market competition is one. There's the second one is a uh, second one of uh, way of thinking about corporate control is um, the idea or the ideal of what some people have called over the years business statesmanship. This is the idea that business leaders should be empowered to exercise their control over corporate institutions for the benefit of all those who have an interest in the corporation. So that the in this sense, the this the executive, the CEO, the chairman is imagined as a kind of tribune who is interested in creating value or um, uh, running the corporate institution in a way that benefits all, all the stakeholders, shareholders, yes, but also workers, consumers, and the community, et cetera. Um, this, this kind of ideal um, flies under a lot of different labels and there are many proponents of what's called stake, um, stakeholder theory or stakeholder ethics these days. But this idea of business statesmanship has been around uh, since the very early 20th century, um, Gerard Swope, um, a well-known leader of General Electric, was one of the earliest proponents of this idea. And so then there's a third way, and this is really, I think, the minority report in American history. Um, and I suppose it aligns a little bit more with what Michael's been talking about. It's, it's what we might call sort of political supervision or stakeholder control. Uh, empowering workers, for example, and other stakeholders with a seat at the decision-making table. Uh, in, in Germany, they do this through a system called co-determination. There are, of course, other models. But the basic idea is that because the corporation is granted remarkable rights and powers, such as the ones that Michael's talked about, limited liability and um, general incorporation and so forth, it should be held accountable to the good of, uh, of all through some means of kind of representative deliberation. Um, so... Those are those are three sort of spins on on corporate control, market competition, business statesmanship, stakeholder supervision. I think that any you know serious project of reimagining the big business corporation will need to take into consideration some or all of those uh, ways into the problem. Um, and of course, that's a big task, and there's a lot to talk about. Um, but I'll end there. I could toss a question over to you, Michael, if you'd like. Um, well, certainly. Um, well, I, I think the question, Kyle, for, yeah, go Kyle, ahead. Before you toss a question, let, let me, sure, go let ahead. me try to throw some chum into the water yeah. so that you two can attack it from your respective positions. Um, uh, quite a question that's sort of raised by both of you, I think, is 
is um, liberal economics, uh, you know, and and the notion of what uh, what what is what are the goods around which a society can construct or allow to emerge an economy that supports an assortment of other goods, whether they be national, communal, uh, you know, larger democratic goods, the good of all citizens, et cetera, um, is what one could say that the so-called neoliberal uh, innovations of the starting around World War II or before, or the dawn, right, just before World War II, were attempts, in a sense, to use economics and particularly the, the power of the market to somehow contain inevitable political tensions that had arisen in democracies, but then led to stagnations uh, that in turn led to the rise of authoritarianism. So neoliberalism originally, the sort of great trust in markets um, and market autonomy uh, was seen as a kind of solution to a political problem. But is, is that really true in your, in your, in the views of you two, or is it something intrinsically, is the, is the sort of market, uh, the faith in the autonomy of the market sort of built into liberalism, going back to the early liberal thinkers, um, obviously to Locke, but uh, to subsequent liberal thinkers, including Adam Smith and so on. Is there, uh, does liberalism suffer from the kind of deficiency that the new post-liberals like Patrick Deneen and others are talking about, that it, that it is intrinsically the problem, that we need to return to some greater good type of thinking? Subsidiarism, for example, which is a position that's advanced in another piece in the current issue. So I throw that out to you as chum, Michael. Yeah, I, I think that the debate about liberalism and anti-liberalism and post-liberalism uh, tends to, in its own way, ignore political economy and, and industry and things like that. My, my perspective mm -hmm. is that the norm uh, of modern economics and particularly the modern industrial era from the even the 16th, 17th century through the Industrial Revolution up to the present, uh, the norm has been developmental uh, economics, developmental capitalism, or developmental statism, uh, whether in, in its, uh, the, the, the British uh, empire, that was the unit, it wasn't the, U, the UK per se, was a developmental mercantilist state with an East Asian type industrial policy from the Tudors all the way up until uh, uh, the 1840s and 1850s when it, when it switched to liberalism. Uh, I, it was, you know, it, it, under the British Empire, it was illegal for the American colonists to make nails. We had to buy them from Britain, and, and our, the Americans were supposed to sly, supply British manufacturing with raw materials, you know. Uh, so the, we had to buy beaver hats from the UK, uh, but we could send them beaver skins, and which was you know, a, a completely uh, anti-liberal thing. George Washington and Alexander Hamilton set up a slush fund to smuggle uh, British textile uh, mill engineers to the United States, to New England, to set up, uh, to steal intellectual property because up until the 1840s, it was illegal for skilled mechanics in the UK to immigrate. Okay, so so liberalism, even in, in the English speaking world is, is fairly new. And the United States did not adopt it until uh, after World War II. Uh, from the Civil War up until the New Deal, the U.S. was a developmental state. It was not laissez-faire. Uh, it, was, it was this close partnership between the government uh, and uh, industry uh, with this really incredibly sophisticated industrial policy of federal subsidies for railroads, uh, a highly differentiated tariffs on particular products, and so on. Now, it was a kind of bipartite corporatism in which government and business were allied against labor. Labor was being crushed 
uh, strikes were being put down by the National Guard and the Pinkertons and and the but it was it was definitely a more sort of what we would think of now as an East Asian industrial policy. Uh, this did not change uh, really significantly under uh, the New Deal era from Roosevelt all the way up until the 1970s and 80s for the simple reason that the United States uh, had had very little exposure to the world economy. The uh, mass immigration was cut off in the 1920s. Uh, and as Europe and Asia recovered from World War II, uh, the, the amount of the economy that was engaged in imports or exports in the US, it was almost entirely autarkic economy. This changes in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so, so I would argue that classical free market economic liberalism uh, really has existed only for 30 or 40 or 50 years in the United States, and that the alternative is some kind of developmental capitalism. And, and you still have, you know, uh, for-profit enterprises and corporations and 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 for-profit banks, and much of the activity is private, uh, but it is steered and subsidized and directed uh, uh, in, in by the state in much more of a way than it has been uh, uh, since uh, uh, really the Carter and Reagan years. Just one, one to, to make this vivid, I'm just gonna close with one a brief anecdote. So in the 1920s, uh, Herbert Hoover, who was not a defender of laissez-faire. He, he was a uh, industrial policy, you know, uh, economic nationalist. Uh, he learned that the South American countries were going to create a guano cartel, literally uh, bat poop, if, if I can be genteel, uh, uh, because guano was a source of uh, potassium, which was an, an essential ingredient for uh, American industry. And like OPEC, they hoped to raise the product of this uh, globally traded commodity through having a cartel. Uh, now this would raise the cost for American factories. So Herbert Hoover summoned a lot of the leading lights of Wall Street, uh, who in those days, were you know Yale and Harvard men first, and you know capitalists second. Uh, and he said, under no circumstances, his Secretary of, of uh, Commerce at the time, uh, under uh, Coolidge, he said, under no circumstances will you allow any bonds for this Latin American cartel corporation to be floated on Wall Street. Uh, and they said, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> and and the cartel collapsed because they could not raise money on Wall Street because they were totally frozen out just with a wink and a nudge from the Secretary of Commerce. So, so that system uh, really you know, uh, uh, was not liberal in the modern sense. Uh, uh, all of the participants saw themselves as part of this, this project of national economic development. And uh, what the New Deal was, it simply added two groups that had been excluded from the Lincoln to Hoover uh, economic developmentalism, which was farmers and uh, workers. Uh, uh, particularly unionized workers, uh, but but it didn't dramatically change it. I would argue the big shift in American capitalism was from developmentalism to uh, uh, what we now would call liberalism, free market liberalism, uh, and that was in uh, the 1970s and 80s. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Kyle, would you like to answer that and then ask your question? I'm sorry to have interrupted that flow. Oh yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, this question about markets, and I, I mean, I don't think that anyone could. I don't. I don't think any any serious person would say that you have to choose between markets and not markets. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's um, who, who wants to banish markets. The question is, what is the proper place of markets? Um, and when it comes to to corporations, they are, in a in a certain sense, seen from a certain angle, they are a kind of suspens suspension suspension um, of of markets in a way, um, in, insofar as the kinds of uh, economic productivity um, and transactions that could would ordinarily occur outside the firm now occurs within the firm and it's and it's planned um, and it's directed um, in in a non in a non market fashion. Um, what you see with what you might call neoliberals of the seventies, eighties, nineties is an attempt to sort of negate and undermine the kind of institutional foundations of the of the corporation. Um, and, and try to transform the inside of it into something that functions much more like a market. I mean, you can see this with, um, with for example, a CEO like Jack Welch, who introduces sort of competitive um, performance 
um, contests among em employees um, in order to to make to justify massive layoffs and and builds his sort of financial uh, his business strategy around around um, share share price and so forth. Um, that's a real transformation of the way that um, American liberals had thought about what the corporation was, which was is a it was a grant of in some ways a kind of government power to organize economic life in a way that they thought was could be more efficient than markets. Um, so that's a bit of a an aside, but I I, I don't think that. Um, I don't think the question is the markets are not markets, but it's about about their their proper place. Um, the question that I was going to throw over to to Michael, I guess, was about scale. I mean, um, Michael, you were saying we we can't fall for a kind of small as small as beautiful um, mirage, but the question that uh, occurs to me is is how how can purpose be incorporated at the kind of scale that we as a, a leading economic nation need to have corporations at. Um, and, and so then the, I guess the question has to do with um, when you're thinking or reimagining what corporate charters could look like, um, how, first of all, are you, are you, are you saying that we need to think about um reforming the chartering system so it's at the national level and not the state level so that's that's one question but the, the second question is how how could on an ongoing basis purpose be um incorporated or or maintained or or in some senses enforced in a corporate institution would there be um an, an administration that sort of a la like theodore roosevelt was envisioning a bureau of corporations that would in some senses kind of regulate the internal conduct of, of corporations at the kind of charter level? Uh, would Congress play that role? Just, I, it's all well and good to issue a charter and say your purpose is to do X or Y for you know, a certain amount of time. But, but how, does that, how does that work within an ongoing sort of business decision-making um, re reality of business life? Who's, who's in charge, I guess, is the question. Well, I, I think I'm the only American who thinks the National Recovery Administration was a good idea. Uh, it was influenced by Gerard Swarp. This was Rose, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's initial New Deal. It was the first New Deal. Uh, it was corporatist in the political science sense. Not you know when you say corporatist now, this this is thrown around as a pejorative, saying you know corrupt or influenced by corporations which is a misunderstanding, 19th and 20th century corporation, corporatism, the corporation was the entire industry, was the industrial sector. It was not a particular firm. Uh, so for example, in the, the National Industrial Recovery Act, you would, you would have regulation uh, uh, by sector. There would not be single national regulations. And uh, each sector, the trade associations would work out uh, code of conduct, uh, recognizing that that many sectors are not truly competitive, have to be approved by the federal government, and they would also have to work out some kind of system of collective bargaining with organized labor. But this was a sector by sector basis. So the automobile sector would have one code, uh, and uh, you know the meatpacking sector would have another one, and the janitorial sector would have yet another, uh, and. When uh, uh, the Supreme Court struck that down on what I think is, I think most uh, lawyers now agree, it was on the specious grounds that this was an excessive delegation of power uh, to the president and to agencies, uh, the Supreme Court flipped since then. And you could not have modern government or regulation without these, these delegations of power. Then the Roosevelt administration had, had basically, the, its program had collapsed which was the sectoral organization of the American economy, including organized labor uh, uh, and you know, social benefits. So for example, uh, you weren't gonna have social security for everybody. That is each industrial sector, uh, all of the firms would work out their own pension schemes uh, that would be universal among the firms in that sector uh, and unemployment insurance and so on. Uh, so so in, in the rest of the New Deal, which is the only one we remember now, uh, we, we got this one size fits all 
system of social insurance, beginning with the Social Security Act, which include unemployment insurance, uh, with the Fair uh, uh, Labor Standards Act in 1938, which set in uh, you know like economy wide minimum wage. Uh, under the the Blue Eagle NRA scheme, there wasn't going to be an economy wide minimum wage. There would be different minimum wages in different sectors. Uh, so. Uh, to my mind, it's, it's obviously getting from here to there is is uphill, uh, but I think that we need to break with the whole idea that we need economy-wide regulation and even economy-wide labor laws. Uh, so, for example, in my book, Hell to Pay, I argue that uh, if you have mass employment sectors with giant corporations, then national sectoral uh, uh, collective bargaining by all of the unions and all of the firms in that sector makes sense. If you have like small janitorial firms, that just doesn't make any sense. You need some other mechanism like wage boards. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that, that's answering your question, but I think that we need to go to sector regulation of everything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's labor laws, you know, uh, let's, let's take hours laws. Does it, you know, pilots have this weird system where they have to, fly for for you know several days running uh and then they have to take many some days or weeks off to recover does it really make sense for a 7-eleven clerk and an airline pilot to be governed by the same regime of but it have, they have to be governed by some regime otherwise they'll be exploited uh by their employers so that's that's my pitch yeah. for sectoralism yeah, no, that's helpful. I, I'm curious about the transition, though. Here, like, what, what, and you know, you you have a background and expertise in law, so and you probably know a lot more about corporate charters than I do. But I'm I'm curious to know, what, in the automobile industry, for example, um, how do you transition from corporate charters that are state based to a corporate charter system that you're sort of imagining in a in a sectoral planning kind of structure? I, I don't think you change the the charters necessarily okay. what you do is uh, and one thing we haven't mentioned is your your three models were were very comprehensive uh in in the us but in, in the comparative perspective there's a fourth model which is bank led capitalism uh in which the corporations raise their money that from loans from banks rather than uh, uh from the stock market uh, by issuing shares or, or, or bonds. Uh, and then there's finally family-led capitalism where the family owns it. It's a, it's a closely controlled private family corporation. Much of Europe, uh, uh, the big firms are, are either bank dominated or they are family owned and private. Uh, and so the problem with our uh, reliance on the stock market was pointed out by uh, uh, Adolf Burley, advisor to FDR, uh, you know, who wrote the great book on, on the separation of ownership and control in modern capitalism with uh, Gardner Means. Now, it's not widely known, but, but Burley wrote a later article, I think it was in the 50s or 60s, a law review article, where he said, the problem with the separation of ownership control in the modern corporation, where the owners are this ever number fluctuating number of shareholders, who don't really supervise, they don't even know if they own shares of the corporation, right? They've invested in a mutual fund or something. <clears throat> the, the managers essentially are unchecked. They're not supervised by anybody. Uh, now, before the New Deal, and this is, this is an important point you made, Kyle, the New Deal actually kind of backfired, I think, in the sense that the New Deal was so hostile to the House of Morgan, which was functioning as a de facto national bank uh, in, in the earlier period, uh, that they wanted this total separation of uh, investment banks and corporations. Uh, now, in the earlier period, uh, as in Germany to this day, uh, in, in, in particularly in the industrial sector, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan and his associates planted their the employees of the banks on the corporate boards uh, and, and kept them in line and disciplined them and steered them. So, so weirdly enough, uh, J.P. Morgan was really a kind of super industrial capitalist concerned with the long-term development of railroads in, in, uh, initially, uh, and then steel and so on, uh, was not trying to make short-term profits. It's not like your you know, vision of Wall Street today. Uh, so I, I think to answer your question, 
I would come in indirectly. I would change the funding mechanism. Uh, that is, I would say that for certain purposes, uh, a corporation, and it can be foreign-owned for all we care, as long as it you know, follows the rules and has factories in the United States and employs people. Uh, let's say a chips corporation, right? Because we have the, the Chips and Science Act. Uh, we would create a policy bank. Uh, policy bank, the only one we have really is the uh, Exim Bank. Uh, and the major tool for industrial policy in other countries is a policy bank. It's an infrastructure bank that lends only for infrastructure projects. It's an industry bank controlled by the national government that lends only for, uh, uh, for manufacturing. Uh, and to my mind, and it's based on comparative you know, historical study, this is much more focused and efficient uh, going through the lending route than this kind of scattershot tax credit thing, where if you, you put up like a fly-by-night you know, solar panel farm, then you get a huge tax credit uh, and there's no coordination. Uh, so so I, I think you, you can't think of particularly uh, uh, defense critical sectors like manufacturing and infrastructure separately from the way that they are financed. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, and again, it, it's sexual, I think, yeah. you know, you know, uh, we should have a certain kinds of sectoral activities should go with certain kinds of finance, including either public loans or, uh, uh, you know, basically steering private banks into certain activities. Yeah. What you're describing reminds me of the um, uh, reconstruction uh, we, finance We have a couple of questions from uh, the chat remarks. Um, uh, uh, let me ask those and then we can open it up. Questions to people, please raise your hands and uh, we'll call on you roughly in the order that we can follow. Um, but there are two questions that have been written in and I put them to you. Um, and then uh, I will have to turn over the moderation of the rest of this uh, discussion for however long it goes to Kyle, who is also one of the participants, because I have unfortunately another appointment. Um, but at first, before I do that, I want to thank Michael very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And I urge everyone to read the most recent of his 17 books. Uh, I've worked with him over the years and admire his work and him very much. And it was a pleasure to see you here today. Uh, pleasure to take part. Kyle, a pleasure, even though I see you more often, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And thank you for uh, coming out today. And I urge you to read his book when it comes out soon from Norton. When exactly, Kyle? Uh, yeah, all fine booksellers will have it on the shelf, I'm sure, <laughs> in February, um, February of next February. year. Yeah. So, so thank you both. But question. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on the coincidence of Friedman's 1970 article and the development of container shipping? To me, this was the technical development that accelerated diminished domestic labor leverage and the liberation of corporate responsibility. That's from Michael Dingus, or Dingus, excuse me for mispronouncing your second name. I'm sure I did. But, uh, and Andrew Lynn, one of our uh, fellows and staff here at the Institute, one of the present trends that can't be ignored in this debate is the rapid vanishing of publicly traded corporations, tracked most famously by Gerald Davis at the University of Michigan. Some of this is a product of corporate mergers and thus reasserts the relevance of our debate, but there are also growing reasons to remain private and avoid transparency and uh, regulation requirements. So one, are the problems of corporate control ultimately then problems of bigness and not the modern corporation? And two, what happens if strengthened corporate control of publicly traded corporations continues to drive bigness into private markets and private entities? I think those questions can go to both of you. Uh, uh, Michael, would you like to yeah, address so one or either, both? I'll, I'll do both very briefly. So I agree with Kyle. The the Milton Friedman article this this is completely overrated. It was it was these objective conditions, uh, and particularly the desire to to break the unions, 
through uh, labor arbitrage. Uh, the American business had already done that through geographic labor arbitrage in the industrial sector, uh, even when the U.S. was more or less autarkic from World War II up until the 70s by moving to the South and to the, the Southwest to, to right to work states. And then it, so then they just took that globally, you know, to dictatorships like uh, China and and low wage countries like Mexico. Uh, and, and it was to lower costs and to crush the unions. You know, that's, it's labor arbitrage. It had nothing to do with free trade or, or uh, it's transnational production. It's not even trade. It's within the same company. Uh, somewhere between a third and a half of what is counted as trade in the modern world, things going across borders, is actually partly finished uh, goods within corporate supply chains. So this is, we're talking about transnational production where the companies, and, and as Kyle pointed out, uh, the, you know, the other factor, once you could do this, and this was not because of, uh, in, of, of international conditions, it was because of loopholes in American labor law. Uh, they found out that you could reclassify full-time employees as contractors. Uh, and and uh, uh, Professor David Weil has written about the Fisher workplace, where, for example, at Google, you know, half the people in the offices are wearing little badges. They're either Googlers or non-Googlers. They just took the receptionists and the uh, the janitors and so on, uh, and and outsourced them so that they have lower wages and and uh, don't have benefits and so on. So they're cheaper. Uh, so so I, I think you know it was objective conditions and corporate uh, strategy that that led to these changes. It wasn't like people slapped their heads when they they read Milton Friedman's article, which as Kyle points out, had just been sitting there for decades anyway. I think it's in his 1962 book on, on yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, and, and he had written about it in a National Review in the 1960s, and yeah. yeah so, so yeah. That, that's that's a myth. Uh, in terms of the rapid vanishing of uh, publicly traded corporations, well, as, as you know from what I've remarked, and and I share Adolf Burley's uh, view that it's not clear the publicly traded corporation was a good idea. Uh, so Burley. So his answer was in a book called The American Economic Republic, he wrote in the 1960s, that no one except for me has ever read. <laughs> uh, his answer was, well, the managers could run amok and they could loot the corporation and they could screw the workers and they could uh, uh, you know, cheat the shareholders. But they're restrained from doing so by their you know, post-World War II sense of civic responsibility. But if they ever become sociopaths, then, you know, Katie bar the door, right? Uh, so, so that's why if it depends on if the reason for going private is just to evade regulations and taxes and, and so on, then obviously it's a bad thing. But for example, if you look at the German Mittelstahl corporations, and now Germany's having trouble now shifting to the, you know, from the old automobile oil paradigm to the new one. Uh, but these were family held corporations uh, and in Budenbrook style, the, the family wanted to keep it in the family uh, for generation after generation. And, and uh, they, they took a long term view. They didn't see it as a cash cow to be looted and then uh, tossed aside. So, you know, I, I think we may there may there can be bad versions of of private corporations, but there can be be good ones as well. Yeah, I think you bring up a, a very good point about um, about Burley's Burley's book. The what is what was it called? The American Republic. The the American Economic Republic. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that goes to my my the point that I've been trying to make in the in the piece and in my remarks earlier was that there is a something like a hidden vulnerability of the corporate system to something like sociopathic share, shareholderism, if you if you will, or um, if if there is not an um, if there's not oversight from shareholders, there's also a possibility for executives to kind of take take that kind of sociopathic route themselves. I mean, the question that I think Burley was getting at that's very, um, I, I really love Adolf Burley's work. And I think that his way of thinking about institutions is just very valuable for thinking about, about corporations today. Um, and this, this question of the relationship between ownership and control is something that's um, really been been lost, in my opinion. It would be helpful for us to um, to bring back and to and to reconsider. Um, we have a question here from Ron Gorkin. Ron, are you on the call? Do you want to um, ask your question yourself? 
Oh, let's see. You're muted. There, there we go. Hello. There you are. Okay. Yes, I had a question for Michael. Um, he seems to suggest that the, there was a great break in the 70s, 80s with neoliberalism uh, in government's relationship with corporations. But the question I had was um, uh, maybe there's more of an evolving relationship with corporations over the last 200 years that's grown troubling to my thoughts. So in the 19th century, you have government working with corporations, but it seems to be more of a promoter of business, for example, in building the railroads and building the Erie Canal. And then it becomes a regulator of business, business in the form of the establishment of the Interstate Commerce Commission and the, the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. Then it becomes a guarantor of business in the form of FDIC during the New Deal. But now it seems like it's really becoming the partner of business. And that does seem new and, and a little scary. So I wonder if, if Michael can comment on that, if, if maybe there's been more of an evolutionary trend toward this troubling phenomena where it's the actual partner, which is, which is new. Oh, I think that's a brilliant way to, to put it. And to be sure, it's a spectrum. The, the story that I think uh, Kyle and I both are telling is about how the corporation gradually grows into this enormous behemoth and, and just escapes the leash uh, that, it, that it originally had when it was a small little baby dinosaur, you know, uh, at the beginning. Uh, I'm not so sure about the, the partner of business per se as opposed to promoter, because I think uh, even if that's true, uh, even the most lobby driven member of Congress would claim that there's some public purpose being served by various pro-business policies, you know, sharing them with tax breaks. In the case of, of most conservatives, you know, uh, helping them to destroy organized labor, that, that at least they would justify it in public and maybe in their own mind as, as doing something that has a, a, that promotes the public good in the way that in the promoter phase, you know, like the, the you know, giving land grants to railroads uh, would. Is that, all right, Ron. Um, okay. Um, I have a question, Michael, that I wanted to throw out there, play a bit of a devil's advocate. It sounds in to me in, in what you've been, what you've written and what we've been talking about today that you, you would take uh, a view that the corporation is a kind of concession of government in a sense that the, the the powers the privileges of the corporation are granted uh in a very special and distinctive way by the state um but of course there are plenty of libertarians who would disagree with you and say that the corporation is something that could have achieved been achieved by manner of you know a complex set of contracts between the different actors and in fact the corporation that sort of exists on its own as a representative of, of the sort of nexus of individuals um, that have some relationship to it. And I'm curious to know what what your retort, what your response would be to that kind of line of thinking. Well, I'll, I'll try not to laugh <laughs> at, at, at the notion that, that the global corporation is a nexus of people with equal bargaining rights, including the secretary and the janitor and the CEO and so on. That's just... That's absurd. I, I know this was, uh, uh, was it Kenneth Arrow who was the economist who was associated with this? Uh, and Jensen Nexus, and Beckling wrote the, but the there, piece. There of... were, yeah, but there was some stuff before that on the nexus yeah. of contracts. Yeah. Clearly, if you look at history, these things were spun off from government, uh, both non nonprofit foundations and agencies, as well as a uh, uh, for-profit corporations, if you go back a few hundred years and it was relevant for us, which was Western Europe, uh, which we're, you know, kind of a, a former colony, uh, it was the king had a tin monopoly and the, uh, the state church ran higher education and orphanages and hospitals, right? And, and it was a state church. It was an arm of the royal government and the, you know, the East India Company was a de facto arm of the, the British government and so on. Uh, so, so the real story, the story that the libertarians tell, uh, as well as many libertarian stories, is, is just a fable where uh, you have like the blacksmith shop, uh, you know, starts off and then like becomes national and then becomes global and it grows up into this big thing just on the basis of the free market. Uh, well, in practice, everything would be a blacksmith shop now, the, the, the largest enterprise would be a blacksmith shop in manufacturing if it were not for limited liability because 
Uh, if you had the partnership form for all enterprises, then you're going to have very small uh, uh, companies where the partners know and trust each other, which was the pattern before uh, limited liability. But you're not going to have publicly traded corporations if if all of the shareholders can lose all of their money and their assets and their savings okay. uh, for investing. So, so I, you know, the concession theory to me is is so clearly right uh, that it, that it's. Uh, alas, there are lots of well-funded libertarians that we must debate with, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's not a serious, there's no serious alternative to the concession theory. Um, if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask, you can raise your virtual hand to get in the queue. Uh, we have a question here from Andrea Belzano. Uh, what role does the elimination of pensions in favor of stock market investing for employee retirement planning play in the problem um, of the unregulated market and financialization. If the stock market had a lesser role in investing in industry, retirement funding would have to go back to pensions. Uh, that's a really important question. Um, Michael. Yeah, well, it wouldn't necessarily have to go back to pensions. You could just expand social security. Uh, and not have any really, you know, serious private uh, retirement savings for most people. I mean, for, you know, for a few affluent people, but even now, Social Security is the vast amount of income uh, for retired Americans, uh, uh, and the majority of them are working class. Uh, so arguably, the, uh, well, there are two, two things. The purpose, uh, as Jacob Hacker has pointed out, of uh, of replacing 401k, uh, replacing uh, guaranteed uh, pensions with, with uh, contributory individual pensions like 401ks is to shift the risk uh, to individuals. Uh, and I'm not necessarily critical of corporations for that because it is taking on an enormous uh, gamble that your company is gonna be profitable enough in 30 years to pay uh, all these former employees, all of your company may not even exist. So we have the pension benefit guarantee corporation that that you know pays these guaranteed benefits uh, uh, to former private sector workers. To me, the answer is just to make it completely social insurance uh, and and just uh, uh, have much more generous social security. Now it's backfired in the sense that uh, and and Kyle, you may know more about this than I do, but there's an argument that a lot of pension funds are be are becoming the most important shareholders of companies and kind of intimidating at least some companies into pursuing short-term profits to get sorry, higher returns. Sorry, can you repeat is that? that right? uh, yeah, the, which group is becoming the? Pension fund managers. Okay. Because now they have these huge pools of pensions. You know, in, in the 70s, I, a few rich people are in the stock market, but now you have you know, much of the population has a 401k or an IRA, and it creates these huge uh, pools of money mm -hmm. uh, that the pension fund managers can invest, and it gives them clout yeah. in corporate decision making. And again, what are they, what are what are they answerable to? They're answerable, you know, to their investors trying to get a higher return for their retirement funds, right? But they're not not answerable to the greater public interest in any way. Yeah, I don't know if what you say about them being more aggressive is, is true or not. Uh, it seems certainly plausible to me. But I think that, yeah, the rise of, of these big investment funds, uh, retirement accounts being um, put into the market makes a big difference um, with these questions of governance, just because you have, like Michael said, these massive pools that are um, managed by a relatively small number of, of people. I mean, this is something Peter Drucker wrote that, art, that book in the 1970s, <laughs> about um, the rise of what he called pension fund socialism, because uh, he, was, he was worried about um, this. Um, you know, it's all well and good if you imagine shareholder um, supervision taking place in a kind of quasi town hall way in which pe shareholders are sort of interested in the ongoing you know, in, um, concern of the business. Um, but when you have these massive pools of, of funds that we see with, um, you know, a, a BlackRock or many other massive institutions, the the uh, the, the governance logic just is turned in a completely different direction. Um, well, P well, Peter Drucker gave a famous interview. I think it's the '80s or the '70s, 
where he said, I used to work in finance. Uh, people in finance don't understand business. They think companies make money. Companies don't make money. Companies make shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Um, I'll, I need to remember that one. Um, to Mark whose house to what extent has stock-based compensation compensation for high level executives impacted salaries and compensation for rank and file workers michael take it away well i i actually think that uh this had far more of an effect on corporate uh structure and financialization than uh milton friedman's article a, a vice president of ibm told me uh that he was there when they began adding stock options to compensation. And he said the entire culture of the corporation and similar corporations changed radically uh, because now the CEO had an incentive to inflate the uh, uh, the stock. Uh, and particularly CEOs are middle-aged, right? They're, they're gonna retire and go to La Jolla and play golf in a, in a few years. So they, they wanna beef up the, uh, the share price as much as possible. Uh, and, and in the old days, uh, if you the CEO just got a, a superior pension, uh, it was in the CEO's interest for IBM or whatever, you know, to be a flourishing going concern in the next uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, to pay that very nice, hefty pension. Uh, and, and the CEO was paid, it was a salaried employee, not uh, getting most of his or her compensation in the form of stock options. Uh, so, and clearly, like the whole stock buyback phenomenon is CEOs trying to goose their, their own personal compensation, uh, you know, by playing these games with, with the stock market. The money does not go into uh, investment in, in productive, uh, uh, you know, plant and, and equipment or expansion. Uh, it's just goosing the, the stock market value of their retirement packages. Um, okay, well, let's see. We have another question here. Ioannis um, from Athens asks, uh, would you say that our times are theoretically closer and justifying Schumpeter rather than Friedman? It's a big question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Oh, oh, definitely. Yeah. And uh, uh, now, and Schumpeter is... I hate to keep throwing out obscure things, but but I, I tend to like <laughs> dig these things up. So Schumpeter is remembered for predicting in capitalism, socialism, democracy, that uh, uh, eventually capitalism would dig its own grave uh, because it would alienate so many people uh, that they would eventually turn to, it would be like democratic socialism or something. It wouldn't be Marxist revolutionary socialism, uh, just, just sort of in disgust. Uh, and it would also undermine the work ethic. Schumpeter is very right wing. Uh, so, uh, but before he died, uh, in a speech he gave in French in Quebec that has only been translated once, it's hard to find. I, I, I can send it to Kyle and anyone can contact Kyle uh, in a couple of days. Uh, Schumpeter said there's an alternative. It was corporatism hmm. in, in the European sense. It's what I'm calling sectoralism. Uh, that is, this was the third way. Uh, between, uh, you know, laissez-faire, liberal, free market fundamentalism uh, and socialism, and he rejected both of them. Uh, so, uh, and, and Schumpeter, uh, the great genius of Schumpeter, and he's not understood. People quote uh, his, his uh, particularly on the right, they quote his phrase, creative destruction, just to mean churn and turnover and businesses rising and failing and entrepreneurship and so on. Uh, he was talking about uh, long-term historical evolution of basic techno economic paradigms, as Schumpeterian economics call it. So, so you, you go from the steam era to the automobile and battery era, uh, and, and now we're going maybe, you know, to the IT era. Uh, and each of those forces a radical redistribution of power, restructuring of corporations, government, welfare states. In, in these in these successive stages. Uh, and so what he meant by creative destruction was not starting a business and then it gets goes out of business and then another one replaces it. He was talking about, you know, Apple and Gates and the laptop replacing the Smith Corona typewriter I went through school on. 
mm. right? You just or 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 the uh, the car replacing the horse and the buggy. So it's a technological, uh, so, it's a technological uh, theory of of development. Then yeah, and he and he, he also was uh, believed there were there were cycles uh, that is, so so it's very 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 interesting uh, thinker. That is, you would have this initial boom uh, of of investment when you have a new general purpose technology like the steam engine or the internal combustion engine or the computer comes along. Eventually, the winners would form oligopolistic uh, uh, corporations. Um, and, and at that point, innovation would shift from inventors to giant research labs of big companies. Uh, but then you would exhaust the possibilities of a particular technology. And at that point, growth would slow and productivity would slow because, you know, so by the 1950s and, and or by the 1970s and 80s, with the old internal combustion engine, you've kind of done what you could do with it, right? You know, and, and so it shifts to matters of style and advertising and things like that. So, so it's kind of a pessimistic view. He did not see uh economic growth as being a straight upward curve it was kind of like a series of s-shaped curves where you go up a little bit then you plateau and then you go up again and then you plateau and and going upward and here i'm editorializing i'm not quoting Schumpeter. uh but the next technological breakthrough gets harder and harder it was much more difficult for the manhattan project to invent nuclear energy uh, and nuclear fission than it was for Edison with his lab of 70 people paid for by JP Morgan and, and uh, you know, various other companies, you know, to come up with the light bulb. So, so we tend to assume that technological progress is this, you know, perpetual thing. But, uh, you know, if you're a Schumpeterian, you don't know what the next technological breakthrough is and whether it will even there will even be a major mm -hmm. technological breakthrough. And if you did, you wouldn't tell the rest of us, you would go out and become a billionaire. <laughs> um, I want to, we're re about reaching time, but I wanted to close with um, one final question for you, Michael, which is um, the thing that's on my mind when I read your work and when I listen to you um, think out loud and help us think about about third wayism and corporatism or sectoralism is, um, I think it's very interesting and thought provoking. Um, and, but the question that comes to my mind is what, what are the political prospects for something like this? Um, wh where do you see the political lay of the land, the kind of coalitions between the parties, if it's possible for there to be a coalition between the parties uh, along um, along these kinds of political economic lines. Um, yeah, what do you see where we're at politically? Well, well, there, there are two stories basically about how political change happens in the US and elsewhere. One is realignment. You, you get a new idea associated with one party and it comes to power and it just kind of rams things through. The other is you get a changing consensus where the parties may be the same, but the elites just change their minds. Right, they and they just adopt different personalities without, you know, radical realignment. And my own view is that changing consensus is more important than realignment. So, for example, if you look at the New Deal era, uh, pretty much by the fifties, Eisenhower, Nixon, the modern Republicans had accepted the elements of the New Deal. They they would tinker with it, but there there was this broad consensus up until the the late seventies and eighties. Uh, neoliberalism is bipartisan from the beginning, right? It's championed by Paul Krugman and Larry Summers and, and uh, many uh, liberal Democrats, Ted Kennedy, big deregulator in, in the 1970s. Uh, and, and it's just shared. It's an elite consensus. It's not a popular one necessarily, uh, but you get a kind of bipartisan consensus succeeds the previous bipartisan mm -hmm. consensus. Uh, and I think we're, we're moving rare, fairly rapidly into a new bipartisan consensus. Uh, for example, if you look at industrial policy and trade and so on, which uh, were completely ostracized and marginalized by the neoliberal consensus, uh, uh, Biden has built on 
you know, some of Trump's tariffs and, and actually expanded a much more rigorous system uh, directed at China in particular. I think it's driven by geopolitical competition. It's not driven by the voters. Uh, it's not driven by popular discontent particularly. Uh, but as we're shifting away from this, what was thought to be a unipolar world uh, after uh, uh, 1989, when the U.S. would simply preside benignly over this integrated global market, it didn't really matter if we deindustrialized and offshored a lot of industry. Uh, if you're in a competitive Cold War II, and I think we are clearly in a Cold War II now, uh, against a bloc with, uh, with uniting China and Russia for the time being, uh, then it kind of makes a difference whether, you know, all of your medical supplies are made in the uh, the rival country and your military rival, you know, or whether you're dependent on supply chains that they control. So, so I think we're probably at the beginning of a prolonged second Cold War, uh, and it will probably see the breakup of the world economy uh, and, and just as a side benefit, not, not directly, it probably will help labor to some extent because when, when in wartime, you want social peace, right? If you don't have any external threats, then, you know, employers can crush labor all they want. But, but if they can strike and paralyze, you know, production in this international uh, rivalry, even if it's a Cold War, you know, then, then I think in the 50s and 60s, I mean, that was in the back of the minds of a lot of corporate leaders, right? That is, we can't have cotton like bloody labor violence, you know, at the height of the first Cold War. So pessimistic in a way, optimistic in another way, but I think of it as just a realistic view. Hmm. Well, mo more food for thought. I uh, appreciate you, Michael, coming and, um, and spending the uh, hour and a half with us. Thank you for writing the piece for us. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for, for being here for this uh, Hedgehog Noontime discussion. And please go to um, hedgehogreview.com to read these essays and more and subscribe. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Well, 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 thank you, Kyle. And I look forward to your book. Thanks, Michael. Bye, everyone. <laughs>